you are with us every week and right now you find yourself in a house church surrounded by people and just community and those folks that you love and by the way how long has it been since you told them that you love them and that you're thankful for them but whether you find yourself just in community surrounded and you're with us every week or this is the first time that you've ever found Miami Valley Church I just want to say I'm so thankful for you in fact I've been praying for you even though I don't know who's listening right now or what time you're listening whether it's uh, as we're broadcasting this live or as we're doing this sometime down the road but I've been praying for you and so I just want to start by praying a prayer for you and for me that God would use this time to speak to our hearts and teach us more about who he is and how he would have us follow him. Almighty God, I just thank you for each one that's gathered in community at House Church, for each one that's listening as they drive down the road, for each one that just by your sovereignty has found this uh, on a podcast, on YouTube. God, just that they would have a sense that you've directed them to this time, to this place, to this moment. And Father, I pray that you would do what only you can do in and through your spirit. Father, may you take your word and drive it deep into our hearts so that we can faithfully follow Jesus all the days of our life. In his name we pray, amen. As we get going today, have you ever noticed that life isn't static? It's, it's not lived like this, but there are seasons, there are times, maybe there are even times when it seems like things, maybe everything is unbelievably good and you're, you're living life up here and then it's followed by this season where things are unspeakably challenged and you begin to see that life is just this roller coaster, roller coaster filled with incredible highs and incredible lows and we find ourselves in a section of the scripture, Exodus chapter 32, as we're going through it all with Pastor Rogers and myself taking you through the scriptures and we find ourselves in Exodus chapter 32 and God's people that we're following, the, the Hebrew people, have just come out of this season of an incredible high. I don't know that it could have become much higher. They had been slaves in Egypt for 400 years and they called out and God heard their cry and he saw their misery and he was concerned and he sent them a deliverer and miracle after miracle they found delivery from the hand of the oppressor miracle after miracle and one of them was they walked through the sea on dry ground and then a, their pursuers followed those seas came in and swallowed them up and they saw God in incredible ways miracle after miracle incredibly high but we enter to this passage of scripture Exodus chapter 32 and I'd invite you to open your Bibles whether you have a, a hard copy like this one or you're finding it on a on an internet or on a mobile device Exodus chapter 32, and we're going to be, in fact, we've been in for the last several weeks with Pastor Woldridge, this season that could be described as the lowest of the lows in the history of the nation, even lower than their time of slavery. And Pastor Woldridge has done this incredible job walking us through Exodus 32, 1 through 4, and he's reminded us what it means to wait and to wait faithfully. And he's talked to us about when we wait, how long can we wait? And man, that, that question just penetrated my heart. He said, are you willing to wait a day, a week, a month, a decade, or even longer for God to do what God's going to do? How long are you willing to wait? And then he reminded us, secondly, that when we begin to wait, we need to have our eyes focused on Jesus. Our eyes need to be fixed on God. It's not just a glimpse, but a gaze. And he challenged just, hey, where's your, where's your gaze? And then he reminded us that we have an enemy that is real, whose job description very simply is to steal, to kill, and destroy. And he's good at what he does. And Pastor reminded us of that over and over again. And then that led them to this incredible sin. And I loved how he said it as he talked. And by the way, if you've not caught up, you can go to Miami Valley Church on YouTube and you can catch up with all of these teachings. Pastor reminded us very simply, that let's say this golden calf, whatever it is, and so much debate among theologians, but let's call it what it is, it's sin. And it showed us what sin did to us and how we need to, to seek forgiveness from our sins. And so I just wanna dig into Exodus chapter 32, verses one through eight, but here's the sermon in a sentence, if I could give it to you. The faith that was required for you to step out will demand faithfulness from you in order for you to stick it out. God has you step out in faith over and over again. Without faith, it's impossible to please him. But as we step out in faith, we have to be found faithful. And so I want to read Exodus chapter 32, verses 1 through 8. Exodus 32, 1 through 8, and I want you to listen. And then we're also going to look. I'm just going to read one other verse. It's Exodus chapter 32, verse 25. So you listen. Maybe you follow along as I read. It says this, when the people saw that Moses delayed to come down from the mountain, the people gathered themselves together to Aaron and said to him, up, make us gods who will go before us. As for this Moses, this man who brought us up out of the land of Egypt, we do not know what has become of him. So Aaron said to them, 
Take off the rings of gold that are in your ears of your wives, your sons, and your daughters, and bring them to me. So all the people took off the rings of gold that were in their ears and brought them to Aaron. And he received the gold from their hand and fashioned it with a graving tool and made a golden calf. And they said, These are your gods, O Israel, who brought you up out of the land of Egypt. When Aaron saw this, he built an altar before it. And Aaron made a proclamation and said, Tomorrow shall be a feast to the Lord. And they rose up early the next day and offered burnt offerings and brought peace offerings. And the people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play. And the Lord said to Moses, go down. Remember, Moses is up communicating with God, having this, this moment. And the Lord said to Moses, go down for your people whom you brought up out of the land of Egypt have corrupted themselves. They have turned aside quickly out of the way that I commanded them. They have made for themselves a golden calf and have worshipped it and sacrificed to it and said, these are your gods, O Israel, who brought you up out of the land of Egypt. Do you see this? God, this incredibly high, high life's not static. And they were in misery and they cried out and God rescued them miracle after miracle. And he, he delivered them and he brought them through this, this sea on dry land and the, the Pharaoh and the army was swallowed up. And now he brings them to this mountain and it says, he says to them, okay, take a breath. You can just stop, you can rest. And I'm gonna to talk to you and I'm gonna organize you and I'm gonna organize you around my word, how I'm gonna to speak to you. And we've seen that he spoke to them in what we've called the 10 commandments and other commandments. And I'm gonna organize you around community that you're gonna be the kind of people that love each other and with everything that you've got. You're gonna love me with all your heart and you're gonna love one another. And I'm gonna organize you around what it truly means to serve me. That was his intent from the start. He said, Moses, go talk to Pharaoh and tell him, let my people go so that they can come serve me at this mountain. That was his intent. This incredibly high of highs, but now they've made an idol and we're gonna look at that. But it was bad, my friends, it was so bad. Look at Exodus 32, 25. Exodus 32, 25 says this. Now, when Moses saw that the people were out of control, if you don't mind marking in your Bibles or highlighting on your mobile device, I'd encourage you to highlight place for these people were out of control. My friends, I need you to understand this is a dangerous situation. And I think this dangerous situation arises because it's all about a sense of time. And when we're waiting, it's about a sense of timing. Look at their perspective and timing. Verse 1 of Exodus 32, it says, delayed. And the sense of delay is, this has been going on for a long time, and we don't know how long it's going to ask. And we are frustrated, and we are fearful, and we are fretting, and we are forgetful, and we're about ready to give up. We're about ready to faint. We're about ready to quit. They felt like it was a delay. But look at God's perspective, verse 8. In verse 8, God says to Moses, you need to go down now because your people have turned aside quickly. What they saw as a delay, God said this took place in no time at all. And these people had corrupted themselves. They were out of control. Look at what they said. They said when they made the golden calf, okay, now people, these are your gods. And pastor walked us through that. They become forgetful. And then look what they did in verse five. It says, they made a feast to the Lord. If you're just listening, you haven't caught it yet, but if you're following along in a good English translation, where it says in verse five, a feast to the Lord, you see that it's capital L, capital O, capital R, capital D. That is the unique name of God that God spoke to Moses. And Moses said, who do I tell them sent me? He gave him this name, this personal name, Yahweh, L in English, capital L, capital O, capital R, capital D. It's a name not used for any of their Egyptian gods, but look what they did. They took their idols, moved them into a time of worship and said, let's use them to worship the Lord. I think that's one of the sins of the American church for so many years. And I'm gonna encourage you at the end of this time in your house church to discuss what I might mean by that statement. I'm not gonna give you any kind of heads up, but I think for all, a long time, we have taken things we've fashioned, idols we've made, and we've pretended that we can use them in the worship of the almighty God who's unique and unlike any other. My friend, this is dangerous. And then I want you to see one other phrase at the end of verse six, a translation I read from said, they sat down to eat, drink, and rose up to play. Some of your translations say it a little more accurately, but none of your English translations get this exactly right. What it should say is, they sat down to drink, to eat, drink, and engage in a drunken orgy. This is using sex as worship. Now do you see why God says they are out of control, that this is not a good thing? And like, whew, so thankful we're not like them. But this isn't just a picture for the ancient Hebrews. This is a picture for us as well. When we begin to fear, when we begin to fret, when we become forgetful, when we start to become faint-hearted, 
we fall into the same trap. It's why the Apostle Paul wrote to a church in Corinth and said this, 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 6 and 7. Now these things took place as examples for us so that we might not desire evil as they did. Do not be idolaters as some of them were. As it is written, the people sat down to eat, to drink, and rose up to play. Paul says, hey, be careful. When you're waiting and your sense of timing is, it's been, God's been delayed, and God's sense of timing is, hey, look how fast it happens. We can fall into the same trap. So what happens in this moment? This was part of our house church discussion last week, and I loved how it was put together, how we kind of came to this conclusion that in this moment, these people, they must have felt vulnerable, exposed, and afraid. They must have felt vulnerable, exposed, and afraid. This Moses, who was their only connection to God, we don't know what's become of him. We don't know how long he's going to be God. Uh, we don't know what's going to happen to us here. And yes, is indeed sin. But often before the sin, there's these feelings of, of vulnerability and being exposed and afraid. So let me make a very specific prediction. You are going to go through times in your life where you feel vulnerable, exposed, and scared. Did I say a prediction? I think I should call that a guarantee. Not because I'm a prophet or the son of a prophet, but this is just the ordinary human experience. You're gonna go through difficult trials in your life. You're gonna come off an incredible high where everything was good and now it's unspeakably challenging and you're going to be looking for assurance and that faith that required you to step out, that was required for you to step out. Now the faithfulness is called into question whether you're gonna stick it out. And because that's the, the normal human experience, we begin to do what so many people do. We trust in gods that we used to know. And we're looking for assurance and comfort in some other ways. And we grab onto the things that God doesn't want us to grab onto, and we begin to use them in ways God doesn't intend for us to use them. In fact, they're idols. So here's what I wanna do. I wanna to talk to you just for the next few minutes about God's timing. Because if we're gonna wait and be faithful to wait the, God, the way God calls us to wait, we need to understand God's sense of timing. Because God said again, remember God said, hey, they've turned quickly from the way that I've laid out for them. And we think, this delay is unbearable. I don't think I can go on anymore. So here's just a few things that I want to share with you. First of all, it's this. God has a timetable for everything that happens. God has a timetable for everything that happens. Ecclesiastes chapter three, verse one says this. There is an appointed time for everything and there is a right time for every activity under heaven. Some of you now all of a sudden have a tune playing in your head and you didn't realize it, but it's from 1965 from a group called The Birds from a song called Turn, Turn, Turn. And you thought they came up with these great lyrics, but it's ripped right out of here out of Ecclesiastes chapter three that there's a time for every season under heaven. That's what God says. There's an appointed time for every activity that God has. Listen to Galatians chapter four, verses three through five. When the right time came, God sent his son to earth, born of a woman and living under the law so that his son could pay for our freedom from the law and adopt us as his children into God's family. God has a timetable for every activity, including it had to be at the exact right time for him to send Jesus, born of a virgin, to live a life of perfection, to die a death on a cross, to three days later rise from the dead so that we could have everlasting life. And so God has a timetable for every activity. And we might be able to say, okay, I can surrender to that because God is sovereign and he can do whatever he wants to do. But then we struggle with this next point. And the next point very simply is this. God does not tell us in advance the details. I think if we had the details in advance, it would scare us and overwhelm us. I hear with people all the time when they talk about God and following him that the majority of people who follow God simply got general instructions. Get up and go to the land that I will show you. That's what he told Abram. Jesus to the disciples just said, follow me. Best I can tell in the scriptures, there's one person who got all the details of the future in advance. His name was Jonah and he was told where he would go. He was told what people he would speak to and he was told the message he was supposed to proclaim. And what did he do? He was scared and overwhelmed and he ran the other way and it did not end well for him. Secondly, I think if we had all the details of the future, we'd try to manipulate it. We'd try to use it for our advantage. Maybe try to make it happen faster. And then finally, I think God doesn't tell us in advance because he simply wants us to trust him. As Jesus is getting ready to ascend back into heaven after his resurrection and after he'd appeared to people uh, for that period of time, he's gathered with them on the mountain and they said, Jesus, tell us when you're coming back, tell us when you're coming back. And Jesus says this, Acts chapter one, verse seven, you don't get to know the time, timing is the Father's business. Timing is the Father's business and in the midst, we need to wait. As we think about God's timing, what we see as a delay and God sees as an instant, God is never in a hurry and he's never late. 
God is never in a hurry and is never late. Second Peter chapter three says this, never forget this, with the Lord a day is like a thousand years and a thousand years is like a day. God's sense of timing and his sense of time is very different than ours. He is timeless. He's not bound by time and his timing is perfect. And sometimes I have to remind myself, my timing is imperfect and I'm in a hurry and God is never in a hurry. He's never early, he's never late, he's always right on time. The prophet Habakkuk says this in Habakkuk 2, the vision will happen at the time I have appointed. It moves steadily toward its goal and it will not be proven false. If it seems slow or delayed, just wait for it. It will certainly happen, it will not be late. And so we're reminded again of Pastor Woolridge's words, how long are you willing to wait? Are your eyes focused and gazing upon God and the Creator? The next thing I think we need to understand about God's timing when we think there's a delay and He thinks it's happening quickly is this, God's timing is not always convenient. Remember earlier it said He has a timetable for everything and He sent Jesus at just the right time, but that was not convenient for Joseph and Mary. Luke chapter 2, verses 1 through 6, just listen to this. At that time, Caesar Augustus ordered that all the people under Roman rule return to their hometown to register and to a census. So Joseph took Mary, his wife, uh, with him to Bethlehem. And by this time, she was very pregnant. In Bethlehem, they came, the time came for her to have her baby. That was not convenient for Joseph and Mary to take that ride from all the way up in Nazareth all the way to Bethlehem. God's timing. He's never in a hurry, and it's not always convenient. But we need to remember this as we're waiting. Everything God does is out of love. He loves you and he cares and he has what's best in store for you. And everything will happen at the right time. Not the easiest time and not with no pain involved, but it will happen at the right time. And that leads me to this thing I also want you to understand. At the right time, God can do anything instantly. Remember, all the way back to Genesis chapter 1, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And the Spirit of the Lord hovered over the wild and the waste. And as the Spirit of the Lord hovered over the wild and the waste, there came a time. And in an instant, God said, and it was so, and it was good. And he spoke, and there was light. Let there be light, and there was light. God can do anything instantly at the right time. Isaiah chapter 60, the prophet says this, God speaking, I am the Lord, so when the time comes, I will make it happen quickly. And that's why I say we try to manipulate it. But these children of Israel, as they're waiting, they feel, ah, this has been a delay. We don't know what's become of Moses. And we feel vulnerable, exposed, and scared. And so we're going to try to work it out according to our own plans. Friends, I understand that one of the most difficult places to be in life is in God's waiting room. Because you're in a hurry and God's not. Well, why are there delays? And Pastor Woldred shared some of these with us last week. And so I just want to reiterate them because I think they're so important for you to catch. Why are there delays? Often there are delays to test our faith. And he pointed you to the book of James last week that we're to consider it all joy when we encounter various trials of various kinds because God is testing our faith. Secondly, there are delays because God is more uh, concerned about our character. God's trying to grow our character. He's more interested in, in what we become than what we do. Again, Isaiah the prophet says it this way, Isaiah 49, verse 8, At the right time, I will answer your prayers. That's what God says. And some of you are listening right now, and you would just say, I've been praying about the same thing over and over again. It doesn't seem like God's answering my prayers. Well, first of all, let me remind you that no is as much of an answer as yes. Maybe he just hasn't answered your prayer the way you wanted it. If you're praying and God just continues to say no, I've found in my life that often when God says no, one of three things is wrong. First of all, the request can be wrong. I shouldn't be asking for it at all because it's not according to the will of God. Secondly, the timing might be wrong. And thirdly, I might be wrong. But what I found out is if the request, the timing, and I am right, then God does things instantly, quickly, when I'm not ready for it. And so here's what I want to do. I want to leave you with four challenges. When I'm in a series of waiting and I feel like it's a delay, but God sees me turning quickly, what do I need to do? Number one, fear not, trust God. Instead of allowing fear to dominate my life, I have a faith that can dominate my life. The faith that was required for me to step out is going to require faithfulness and other steps of faith so that I stick it out. I can trust God in times that I don't understand. And when I trust God, it causes my, my fear to die down. Remember over and over on many occasions, just one recorded in Mark chapter 5, Jesus would turn to his disciples and say, do not be afraid, just trust me. 
I love Psalm 31, verses 14 and 15. It says this, I trust in you, Lord. You are my God, and my times are in your hands. Baby, you need to memorize those verses today. I trust in you, Lord. You are my God, and my times are in your hands. And we surrender that to him. Psalm 69, 13 says it this way. I pray to you, Lord, so that when the time is right, please answer me and help me with your wonderful love. When you are in a time of waiting and you begin to fret or, or fear, let me just encourage you, fear not, trust God. Next, let me encourage you to fret not. Be patient and humble. Fret might not be a word you use much. It was a word my grandmother used with me all the time. Don't fret your little head away. I see you fretting your little head away. To fret means to be constantly or visibly worried or anxious. Do you think this described the children of Israel in this Exodus chapter 32 passage? Yes, they were constantly and visibly worried and anxious. And so it led them to behavior, it led them to sin that was outrageous and outlandish, maybe the lowest of the lows. But every time you and I wait patiently on God, it's a sign of faith and humility. Our verse for the decade has been Psalm 37, 3 that says, trust the Lord and do good. Later on in Psalm 37, verses 7 and 8, the songwriter says this, wait and trust the Lord. Don't fret when others prosper or their dishonest plans succeed. And don't get angry or upset. It only leads to trouble. Would you agree that their fretting here in Exodus 32 led them into some serious trouble? We're going to see that trouble as we go on in the next several verses. My friends, worry is worthless. It wastes the day. It wastes the moment. It wastes the opportunity. Philippians chapter 4, verse 6 says this, Don't fret or worry. Instead of worrying, pray. Let your prayers and petitions shape your worries into faith. What an amazing opportunity. 1 Peter 5, verse 6 says this, Humble yourselves under God's mighty hand so that he can lift you up at just the right time. Fear not, trust God. Fret not, be patient and humble. Third, in times of waiting, when you think it's uh, been a delay and God says it's happening quickly, study, uh, forget not, forget not. Study God's promises to you. Understand his word. Remember, one of the things God was trying to do, he was trying to organize them around his word to become familiar with his voice. And so many times when we step out in sin, it's because we forgot one, God's word. And I hope that your house church did the activity that Pastor Woldridge encouraged you at the end of last week's sermon, that you studied the temptations of Jesus and saw how Jesus used his word, used the word of God to combat every temptation that came his way, even when his enemy misquoted God's word, Jesus set him straight and said, yes, but this is what it actually says. My friend, do not forget God's word. It's why we have been so adamant over the years to encourage you to let God, to take God, let, let his word in, let it root, let it grow, to listen to it. And it does my heart so good to hear how many of you are continuing just to listen to God's word. Uh, you found it on the Bible app. And by the way, if you don't know the Bible app, we'd love to uh, show you which one we use. You can start, uh, just email us at start at miamivalley.org. If you don't have a copy of God's Word and you don't just want to use a, an online version, you want a copy but you don't have it and you can't afford it, let us know. We'd be happy to put a copy of God's Word in your hand. But we think it's important to, to let it in, to listen to it over and over, to let it root, to study it, and to let it grow, to apply it. Listen to what James 1.25 says. It says this, if you keep looking closely into God's perfect Word, that sets people free and you keep on studying it, and you don't forget it, and you put it into daily practice, you will be blessed by God in all that you do. Let it in, let it root, let it grow, but don't just take it in and hear it. Take it in so that you can put it into practice so that you can apply it. The ancient songwriter, Song 1, Psalm 1, says this, Happy are those who find joy in obeying the word of the Lord, and they study it day and night. They are like trees that grow strong beside a stream and bear fruit at the right time, and whose leaves do not dry up. They succeed in everything they do. Fear not, trust God. Fret not, be patient and humble. Forget not, study the promises of God's word. Let it in, let it root, let it grow. And then I'd encourage you, faint not. Don't give up. Galatians chapter 6, verse 9 says this, We must never get tired of doing what is right and good, for at the right time we will reap a harvest of blessing if we do not give up or quit. Friends, it's easy to look at what's going on in life and say, this is a delay and we don't know what's going to happen. But God says, don't turn too quickly. Fear not, fret not, forget not, faint not. Let me end this way with you today. I believe that's always the right time to do several things. First of all, our verse for the decade simply says, it's always time to trust the Lord and do good. But let me put it in a different way. Isaiah chapter 30, verse 18 says this, The Lord still waits for you to come to him so that he can show you his love. My friend, it's always the right time 
to come back home to God. Some of you have been going through a season where everything was incredibly high and your relationship with God was great and everything was incredibly good, but now you find yourself in a valley and everything is unspeakably challenging and you've started to drift and you never drift towards God. You always drift away from God. And to those of you who have drifted away from God, it's always the right time to come back to God. Acts chapter 3 verse 19 says this, Now is the time to change your ways and come back to God so that He can wipe away your sins and pour out showers of blessings to refresh you, my friends. It is time and it's always the right time to come back to God. And some of you have been feeling guilty because of your sins. Some of you haven't sought repentance. And we'll talk about in that, that about, about that in the weeks to come. But friends, it is time. Do not leave your house, church, without talking to somebody about the fact that you want to come back to God and you want to start living for Him and you want to serve Him with all of your heart, soul, mind, and strength. My friend, it's always the right time to come back to God. Secondly, I would say to you that it's always the right time to receive the saving grace of Jesus. Some of you have never surrendered your life to Jesus Christ. Some of you have never believed and said, with, if you confess with your mouth and believe in your heart that Jesus, if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. First Timothy 2, 6 says this, Jesus gave himself up to pay for the sins of everyone. He is the proof that God wants all of us to be saved. And that proof came at the right time. My friends, it's always the right time to say yes to the grace of Jesus Christ. 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 2 says this, This hour is the right time to receive my grace. Today is the day of salvation. Today I'm ready to save you. My friends, Jesus stands ready to save you. Have you ever confessed with your mouth and believed in your heart? We believe that Jesus was born of a virgin. He lived a life of perfection. He died a death on a cross. In your place and in my place, he became our substitute sufferer. He rose from the dead so that you could have everlasting life. And you simply need to ask him, Jesus, I want to receive your grace. I desperately need it. Come into my life, Lord Jesus. It's always the right time to receive the grace of God. And finally, I would say to you, it's always the right time to do good in the name of Jesus. Autumn and I were watching a, one of our favorite TV shows, and we were shocked when part of the dialogue include, included this statement that, hey, that's from the Bible. And the person went on to quote it, and it's from Matthew, uh, let your light shine before uh, men. Don't You don't have a light and put it under a bushel, but let your light shine before men that they may see your good deeds. <laughs> and that's where it stopped, because they surely didn't want to say that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. It's always time to do, there's always, it's always the right time to do good in the name of Jesus. We've talked about this on Tuesday nights. And by the way, if you're not joining us in person at the Carnegie, at the Life Center at Carnegie in the downtown Miamisburg or on the Zoom call on Tuesday nights, I just believe it's still the most important thing we're doing as a community of faith. Right, right beneath that's house church. If you're not in a house church, you need to get in a house church. But we were talking about this, about waiting, and we talked about but there's still a task ahead of us, and that task that's ahead of us is to love God with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength, and to love our neighbors as we love ourselves. The task is to make disciples of all the nations. That never goes away. And there's always time to do, it's always the right time to do good in the name of Jesus. Galatians chapter 6 and 9 says this, We must never get tired of doing what is right and good. For at the right time, we will reap a harvest if we don't give up or quit. The children of Israel, and we've watched their journey and they have given up, and they have quit. And God says, don't. Friends, where do you find yourself in the time of life, in this, this season of life, and it's, it's this, if everything's incredibly good, or things are unspeakably challenging. The faith that was required for you to step out and follow Jesus the first time will demand faithfulness in order for you to stick it out. And if you don't stick it out, here's what's gonna happen. You will find yourself to turn, you will find yourself turning to gods that you used to trust. We'll talk more about that in the days ahead. But here's the verse of scripture I want to leave you with. Listen to Isaiah the prophet one more time, Isaiah 30. The Lord still waits for you to come to him so he can show you his love. He will conquer you to bless you, just as he said, for the Lord is faithful to his promises. Blessed are all those who wait for him to help them. Are you willing to wait? How long are you willing to wait? Will your eyes stay gazed on Jesus? Will you be aware of your enemy who wants to lead you into sin when you feel vulnerable, exposed, and scared? Or will you begin to wait, trust, wait trusting God's timing? Friends, he's waiting for you to come to him so that he can show you his love and give you the endurance that you need to stick it out until Jesus returns. Almighty God, would you take the word that you've shown us this morning, plant it deep in our hearts. Father, for the one that's never received the grace of Jesus, would you show them that now is the right time, today is the day for their salvation, that they should surrender and say yes to the grace that you offer through Jesus. 
Father, if they don't know how to do that, would you just encourage them to reach out to somebody in their house church or to give us a call or send us an email? Father, that they might say yes to the grace of Jesus. Father, today is always the right time. Now is always the right time to come back home to God. Father, if we've drifted, if we've taken idols and tried to use them in our worship, if we've become corrupt or we're out of control, God, now's the time to come back. And Father, today, now is the time, the absolute right time for us to do good in the name of Jesus. Father, help us to trust you and do good all the days of our life as we keep our eyes focused on Jesus. In his name I pray, amen.
Thank you. 
Thank mm-hmm. you.